Uh, Congressman McCall made a comment this week about um, what he says sounds like Russian propaganda from, from some conservative media uh, and why it's so difficult to explain to Republican voters why supporting Ukraine is important. He told Julia Yaffe, quote, I think Russian propaganda has made its way into the United States, unfortunately, and it's infected a good chunk of my party's base. He singled out primetime shows on conservative channels. Do you agree with him? And, and how big is this problem? No, oh, it, it is absolutely true. We see directly coming from Russia uh, attempts to mask communications that are anti-Ukraine and pro-Russia messages, some of which we even hear being uttered on the House floor. I mean, there are members of Congress today who still incorrectly say that this conflict between Russia and Ukraine is over NATO, which, of course, it is not. Uh, Vladimir Putin having made it very clear, both publicly and to his own population, that his his uh, view is that this is a conflict of, of a much broader claim of Russia uh, to Eastern Europe, and including claiming all of Ukraine territory as, as Russia's. Now, to the extent that this propaganda takes hold, it makes it more difficult for us to really see this as an authoritarian versus democracy battle, which is what it is. President Xi of China, uh, Vladimir Putin himself have identified it as such. We need to stand up for democracy. We need to make certain that, that we know uh, that authoritarian regimes never stop when they, when they start in aggression. Um, Ukraine needs our help and assistance now, and this is a very critical time for the U.S. Congress to step up and provide that aid. So, Mike Brain, you are a former Army intel officer, an expert in combating propaganda and mis- and disinformation. Are you surprised that Russian propaganda, in some cases almost verbatim, is making its way to the floor of the United States House of Representatives? Hey, Ken. I mean, it's funny. I feel like I give you the same answer every week about a different thing. Um, I am not surprised at all. And at the same time, I'm, you know, I'm horrified and surprised. Right. So, so we should expect uh, that obvious uh, adversary propaganda. And let's just let's just call the Russians adversaries or at least the Russian government an adversary for the time being. Um, you know, it's it, it should be shocking to see that reach you know, the floor of the house, right? You, you would expect, um, you know, in the 1950s to not see Soviet propaganda reach the floor of the house. You expect in the 1940s to not see German propaganda reaching, or Japanese propaganda reaching the floor of the house. Um, so it is shocking to an extent, but we've also been seeing this for a while. Um, you know, I remember all the way back in the early days of the 2016 campaign, um, that presidential election, you know, some of us who, pay attention to Russia or pay attention to the way that information flows, uh, started to notice that talking points or conspiracy theories that uh, were appearing on Russian language only websites like Sputnik uh, would be coming out of the mouth of, of one of the candidates. And we, we all know I'm talking about Trump hours later. Um, and you have to figure that's not accidental, right? That the, the Trump campaign wouldn't have some random Russian speaking intern scouring Sputnik for talking points for the candidate to use, um, you know, this was something that it didn't happen by accident and, and happened fairly frequently. And I think that's only intensified. Um, unfortunately, you know, the, the online nature of the way we talk to each other and the global nature of, of what used to be called the marketplace of ideas and is now, I think, in some ways more of a cognitive battlefield. Um, it just makes it hard to trace this stuff, but a lot of it does start outside the borders of the United States. There's no doubt about it. Um, and, and a lot of it is done with, with ill intent, with the intent to, to influence American national security policy and foreign policy by influencing our politics and influencing our politicians. But that threat has always been there uh, almost throughout our history. It was certainly there during World War II. It was there during the Cold War. You actually make the point really compellingly in against all enemies, the documentary film, that we were able to counter it back then. Something about how we thought about it, or maybe it was just the reality of the technology available at the time meant we effectively countered Nazi propaganda domestically during World War II. We effectively countered Soviet communist propaganda during the Cold War. What is so different about this time that Putin is able to get Russian propaganda into the Republican Party as a talking point? I think that's dead right. Um, this stuff is not complicated. I've got an old book on my bookshelf called Propaganda, a handbook, you know, and you flip through it and it's 
you know, 16, 17 different, these are very simple rhetorical techniques or traps of language or just ways propagandists work. Um, it's all the same stuff now. So, you know, it's, it's not hard to spot once you know, know what you're looking for. Um, and we've had a lot of luck in the past and, and a lot of success educating our own people, our own, our, our own neighbors on what to look for. Uh, you can look at old public service announcements from the 40s and 50s and 60s and see, you know, hey, you hear somebody saying this stuff? Well, that, that's here's where it's coming from and here's what you should say, right? Um, so we know how to do this. The issue is now, of course, that one of our two major political parties uh, feels that they, you know, by and large are going to benefit from this if they join in. Now, we've never had that before. There was a bipartisan consensus around defeating Nazism. There was a bipartisan consensus around defeating Soviet communism. We don't have that right now. Uh, it's been eroded effectively, and it's coming from the very top of you know the, the ticket in you know in our election. Can you talk about the different vulnerabilities that propagandists are exploiting within the Republican Party? I have to assume some members are just willing dupes. They see what what you perceive uh, in that some of this propaganda is advantageous to them because it's anti-Biden. I would imagine some of them are actually sympathetic to, to Putinism and Putin himself. That's another part of it. It's, it's not cynical in that sense. They actually, I mean, in the clip we played at the beginning, Mike Turner described this as a battle between democracy and authoritarianism. I think what's left unsaid is that that might be appealing to some in the Republican Party. The idea that authoritarianism is preferable, given who leads their party right now. Are there different motivations within the Republican Party that make them susceptible to this kind of propaganda? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, you know, to some extent, some of there's, there's no getting around it. Some of these guys do really like authoritarians. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a reason that uh, Viktor Orban and hung Hungary has ha become the hot destination for guys like Fekel Carlson. You know, want, they all want to go to, to Viktor Orban's Hungary because they view as him at the, you know, as, as a successful far right politician. But, you know, he's a rising autocrat um, and there's clear admiration for that. You know, Tucker, of course, went and granted Putin a long, rambling, bizarre interview fairly recently. So some of these people admire strong men, um, which we could talk a lot about. Uh, and I think some of these folks do have questions about American foreign policy and some of which are, are legitimate and do have questions about, uh, you know, how isolationist, quote unquote, we should be. Um, and I think it's fair to have a debate about American foreign policy, especially after the 20 years since 9-11 and, and all that that entails. Um, that's an above board thing to do. Um, what I think is not above board is doing it by trying to characterize uh, a moral equivalence between a country that has been invaded for the sake of taking its territory and erasing its national identity. I'm talking about Ukraine, of course, and a country that sort of woke up in the morning and decided to do that. Uh, you know, that's not uh, a matter of moral equivalence. It's not really from a policy perspective. A neutral thing to do. You got to think about the implications of what that would be for the world if everybody just kind of got to do that sort of thing, right? I, I happen to like your car, so to speak, or your oil field, so I'm just going to go take it. That doesn't work at the interpersonal level. It shouldn't work internationally either. Um, and so that whataboutism has become a big piece of this too. So I think some of this is also just a fig leaf to hide behind. It's a way to attack the Biden administration for one of its greatest successes, which has been up to this point, um, you know, taking a Ukrainian defense that that many people, uh, many experts thought would last weeks and giving it the tools and the international support to last years. Most of the credit for that goes to the Ukrainians themselves. Um, but I think there's some politics here, too. It's Ken Harbaugh on the Midas Touch Network. The film Against All Enemies, which I co-produced with Ben Micellis and this network, is the number one documentary on Apple TV, and it's now available on Amazon. If you haven't seen it yet, check it out and please leave a review. It really does make a huge difference in helping spread the word. Thanks, Midas Mighty. Let's use our power well.
What if ordinary people like you and me could change the world with the push of a button? Meet Lomi, the world's first kitchen appliance designed to turn your home into a climate solution by transforming your food scraps into nutrient-rich plant food. Now that I've invested in a Lomi, it's changed the way I deal with my food waste. Lomi is the biggest innovation in the modern day kitchen since the dishwasher. It's a smart and simple solution to turn food scraps into plant food. In just four hours, Lomi transforms almost anything you eat into nutrient rich plant food at the push of a button. It helps cut the chore of taking out the trash in half and it eliminates bugs and odors in your kitchen. And here's a bonus. You get to feed your lawn and garden with an all natural fertilizer that you just created out of your food scraps. Lomi has helped me turn my home into a climate solution. Now I can transform my organic waste into nutrient rich Lomi earth that I can feed to my plants, lawn or garden instead of sending it to the landfill. I can help the environment and make my life easier. All my food scraps, plant clippings, and even those leftovers I forgot in the back of the fridge can go back into my garden, helping me grow more nutritious food at home. And now Lomi's new app lets me track my environmental impact, earn points for every cycle, and redeem for freebies from Lomi plus other great brands. Lomi promises to bring you the best possible experience every time you run a cycle. They are one of the only kitchen appliances that has a full no questions asked lifetime warranty on all devices. And they don't stop there. Lomi looks after you from day one and beyond. When you purchase a continued subscription, you'll automatically get upgraded to a new Lomi device every three years. It feels great to know that I'm creating Lomi Earth instead of waste. I have a basically limitless supply of plant food for my garden, plus I'm helping save the planet. Whether you want to start making a positive environmental impact or just grow a beautiful garden, Lomi is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash boats and use the promo code boats to get $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to Lomi.com slash boats and use promo code boats at checkout. Thank you, Lomi, for sponsoring this episode. You've been to Ukraine. I am headed there in a few weeks, but you saw recently liberated territory. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, towns like Buka. Were you in in Buka? I was in Buka. I was in Buka. I was um, in Kharkiv. Yeah. Can you talk about what's at stake? This isn't. I mean, it's rhetorical for a lot of Republican members of Congress. It's not rhetorical for the Ukrainians, and you saw that up close. It's existential. Um, you know, like you, I've, I've seen a lot of war zones. Um, you know, I've been to Syria, I've been to Iraq, I've been to Afghanistan, other places. Um, Ukraine, the, the level of destruction visited on normal civilian communities, small towns. Buka is a mid-sized city, kind of like Bethesda. It's a commuter city on the outskirts of of the capital. Uh, but I also went to a lot of small towns that are sort of right up against the Russian border and have tra- changed hands multiple times. Um, the, the Russian military seems to have pursued a policy of deliberate destruction of civilian life. And by that, I don't mean they missed a target and hit a hospital. I mean, they did destroy the hospital with artillery and then they went in with torches and burned it by hand just to make sure that there's no health care. Um, they didn't just shoot up the school. They turned the basement of the school into a torture facility and then tortured which you saw. people, which I saw. Yeah. Which we, we investigated yeah. a few of these and, you know, you go down there and it was, it was a fresh, a fresh crime scene, like something out of a bad movie. Um, you know, the electrical cables and the whole nine yards, right. Um, down where they store the extra textbooks in the local village school. So, you can go through these towns and you'll see every single house has been just wrecked um, by hand in some cases. Right. And so it seems to be a deliberate policy of essentially, you know, as the Bible would say in the old Testament, no stone shall stand upon another stone. Um, That's not a a war of choice for the Ukrainians. I mean, if somebody's going to come to your home and torture and murder your neighbors and literally destroy your house, your options are limited. Um, and that's, that's what the Russians have done in every place in Ukraine that they've, that they've managed to take hold even for a few days. That's what they do. Do you think the Mike Turners of the world, the Republicans who see that clearly, in spite of some of our other policy differences, my policy differences with them, do you think they have any hope of winning this argument within their caucus when they have a, a leader in the in the person of the former president 
uh, who is clearly favoring Putin, who has nothing but contempt for Ukraine and, and their fight. Uh, what, what, what hope do we have that the, the saner heads within the Republican caucus can win this argument? You know, I, I have to hold that hope because the stakes are as high as they are for Ukraine. They're so much higher. Um, you know, the stakes for Czechoslovakia in the late thirties were high, but the real question is, you know, since 1945, despite all kinds of bad things and mistakes around the world and a lot of bloodshed, we've managed to live in a world where the whole planet doesn't go into major power war again the way we did twice in the first half of the 20th century. These are conflicts that stagger the imagination. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to talk, you know, World War II, we've all seen Saving Private Ryan. We're, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people dead on the battlefield in the course of five or six years, most of them civilians everywhere on the planet. And that, that was before nuclear weapons were in, in widespread use, right? This is a war about whether we go back to that kind of a world. And that's, there's nothing foreign about that question. But that's a question for my kids and your kids and, the, and, and everybody's kids. So I think, you know, I disagree with Mike Turner about a lot of things, but I think he knows that on the basis of his life experience. Um, I have to hope he prevails. And I have to hope that this is a cynical political game for a lot of his colleagues, because when you really talk about taking the world over the brink in a way like, you know, that, that, that could encourage major power war in every corner of the planet. You, you got to hope somebody takes a step back and really thinks about the consequences of what they're doing. Me too, Mike. Uh, I hope you're right. We'll see how the, the next few weeks play out. I think they're going to be decisive on this question. Uh, really appreciate your insight. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ken. Take care. So with that, Gary Kasparov, um, we were commenting in our break that um, it does appear that the most, how should we say it, most vulnerable among our lawmakers seem to be the ones that are spouting all of this Russian propaganda. And it is so easy to track, I'm sure, for you when you hear Tommy Tuberville say something like, actually, the United States pushed Russia into this war with Ukraine. I think Putin's on top of his game, the words of Senator Tommy Tuberville and everything we've heard from Marjorie Taylor Greene. When you hear United States officials saying those things, what does it sound like to your ear? I can't believe my ears. I grew up in a world where America was a formidable force. Love or hate, it was there. And what's happening now is just, it's for me and my European friends, is like the world is falling apart. And, uh, and calling it disinformation is probably too generous. Outright lies. They don't even pretend to, to uh, make it sound as, 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 as real. Love this video? Make sure you stay up to date on the latest breaking news and all things Midas by signing up to the Midas Touch newsletter at MidasTouch.com newsletter.